Okay, welcome. It is July 20th. Uh, the Minecraft DevSync starts now. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, today, uh, as we discussed at our last meeting, I want to try do things, doing things in a little bit different way, and hopefully, hopefully we can be more efficient. Um, so I'd like to start off today uh, going through the tickets, but I'd like to go through them in a very specific way. We used to do this uh, in the last couple companies, and we called it the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we'll just go through everybody, and uh, rather than going through ticket by ticket, um, just give us a quick update on what's going good, and what is bad, and then what is really ugly. And the ugly stuff, is, what's the distinction between bad and ugly? Uh, basically, it boils down to uh, bad stuff is just bad stuff. You know, you didn't get done what you wanted to get done, or you know, you had to run to the hospital, or something like that. Uh, the ugly stuff is stuff that you is blocking you from getting work done. So, if there's just something that you you can't make progress on uh, for some reason, uh, or you're not going to be able to finish it in time, then that's the time to to bring things up. So. Um, so let's just go through uh, everybody, and we can reference the Jira tickets. That's that's a good thing to do, but um, but I don't want to go through them item by item. So let's just highlight uh, you know what you did get done, what didn't get done, and if there's any any real problems going on. So uh, so we'll start off with that. Uh, then we can uh, and we'll try to keep the discussion to a minimum. So it's just you know people giving us their status, and then we'll go through and we'll have a discussion about uh, the things that came up during that status update and uh, we can prioritize those and uh, and you know sort of limit the scope of our discussion and that's it so let's go with uh, Ken first okay so the good was that last Thursday, I listened to my marching orders and began investigating how to start tuning our hyperparameters. Uh, that required me to figure out what they were and see if they were accessible, which they were not. Uh, there are more, I'm sure, in there, but the top ones that I've surfaced so far uh, our ethics batch sizes, they're kind of related. Uh, dropout, dropout rate is the gradient dropout rate. Sensitivity and RCUs, which is basically the long-term, short-term memory gates. Uh, so those all have variable values that we could be using in this. Uh, obviously, we're, we're trying not to enumerate every value. So I came up with what I believe is common sense regarding some of them to get started. But I can certainly see in the future, maybe even a machine learning model to control the hyperparameter tuning so we could be AI squared. That being said, uh, I was getting ready to, I had done some initial testing over the weekend with it because I had to modify some of the code, some of the precise code, because not all these, none of these parameters actually except for Epic were accessible, now they are. Uh, I added some command line parsing and stuff to the train um, I don't know what that was. That was interesting. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's where I'm at. I'm getting ready to put some of the um, code up on the uh, Lambda server and fire up some uh, hyperparameter tuning runs. They'll probably be uh, many hours, maybe even uh, consuming the better part of a day or two. And when I get some initial results, I'll obviously uh, post them next uh, Thursday or earlier and share them so that People could show some insight maybe into what we're seeing. Um, and then once I complete that, it's, uh, you know, like I said, I don't need to sit there and babysit it when it's running. I just need to get it kicked off. Uh, so then I'll get back into the data pipeline process and handling the ability <clears throat> to delete anybody whose data we need to delete. Um, and I'll leave it with this. Uh, Gez asked a question regarding what does that mean? Does it mean we completely eradicate the data? Uh, in which case we could break some relational uh, stuff, or does it mean that we flag it as deleted? And what I'm leaning towards is um, once I get the database back in sync with the pipeline process, um, leaving a, uh, adding a new column to the database, which says this uh, person opted out and their data has been deleted, 
And so any of those, so I would actually physically delete the files from our system, but I would keep in the database an entry that they used to exist and they've now been deleted. There'll be a column that indicates that. So Gez, that's kind of how I was leaning, unless anybody has any better input, that's what I'm planning on moving on to as soon as I get these hyperparameter tuning tests uh, fired up in the morning. That's, that's it. And I don't have anything blocking me, I'm, I'm fine. The only bad would be that the enumeration of all these values is in the millions, and I'm trying to figure out a way to keep it reasonable, maybe a quarter of a million uh, at a run. Uh, I've got some uh, parallelism I've introduced to try to help us step through some of that. So I'm looking, I, I like to keep runs under 24 hours if possible, so I'm leaning towards that. All right, thanks, Ken. Um, so I took down a couple uh, things that we could talk about. Um, we could talk about the data deletion and the priority of that versus you know, the hyperparameter tuning. Uh, and then uh, we could also talk about the, um, the goals with respect to the hyperparameter tuning. And maybe that's the thing we can do offline. But how do we know when we're done, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at there. OK, so, um, so let's go with uh, Chris Gislin. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, I spent um, most of the time documenting actually the last few days. Uh, so the uh, the questions around the open data um, re-triggered the fact that we we don't really have an easy way for people to to read what that means, um, and it's been something I've been meaning to document for quite some time. So. Um, have started that, um, and so yeah, keen to keen to keep discussing that um, and make sure that, that is 100% accurate before we um, before we push it out there into our actual documentation. Um, uh, so mostly good. Um, the the testing stuff is is just um, you know continuing. Uh, as in every time our CI runs, um, and that's been going well. Um, uh, and then the other piece has been looking at all of the boot up stuff um, and ensuring that the device is actually ready when it says that it's ready, um, uh, which has also led me into um, starting to document the document actual Minecraft core processes a bit more um, because currently the sort of best thing that we have for that is a four-year-old video from Steve about how he was going to design it. Um, uh, so yeah, I've, um, I've been getting into that because it's not an area of Minecraft that I've actually dealt with a lot before. Um, so yeah, uh, generally pretty good, um, just documentation takes time. Okay. That's me. Um, all right. Thanks, guys. Uh, Chris there. So the good is that I have a new version of the um, of the Pi Four image uh, for Project Rollover. Um, basically, I took the um, the results of our last sprint. Our last bug fix sprint. I've I also um, completed that sprint and started the bug fix sprint too. But I took the results of our last bug fix sprint and built a new image out of it, uh, and that is uh, should be uploaded right now. And I started a new naming convention for the images. That's um, more like some of our other naming conventions. So basically, this is the first image of July. 2020, so this image is 2020.7.1. Um, the last image I renamed to 2020.6.1. And I also um, am getting ready to publish a Confluence page that has release notes for each of these image releases in them so that we can tell what went into each and if something went wrong, maybe be able to backtrack and see, you know, where we screwed stuff up um, from image to image. Um, 
So I will publish that soon and put it in, a Jira, in the Jira ticket I'm using to track this new release of, um, of the Pi 4 image. Um, the bad is that I was, it took me a long time. One of the things I did was uh, since the, the Mycroft display repo, since that is now, I'm sorry, since core is now up to date. Let me start over. <laughs> since the branch we use for this device <laughs> in core is now up to date with the dev uh, branch of core, um, it is now on version 2002, but all the skills in uh, the PyCroft build I started with are 1908. So I took some time and upgraded all the skills on the device, but that broke some stuff. So it took me a while to get through those upgrades, figure out what was breaking um, and get it all to work again. Um, I updated the instructions for building the image to reflect this. Um, hopefully, I'll get to a point where I'll start with the last image and build upon it rather than starting from scratch. But, um, but yes, yeah, so that took a good part of, of Friday was getting this image up and running again. But it is, um, and it has everything in it. Um, the blah, the ugly is that I tried to update our WordPress instance um, last week and I, there's a droplet out there called maintenance page that I figured was what we used last time to do a maintenance page, but there doesn't appear to be anything on it. So um, I'm really, I'm not sure where we're keeping that maintenance page right now. I don't remember. Um, so if anybody, guys, if you remember anything about that or that will help me um, get the maintenance page up so I can resize that droplet. Um, that would be awesome. Right now that's on hold until I can figure out where that maintenance page is living. Um, and yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, okay, thanks Chris. Um, let's see, I guess Derek is next on my screen. Hey guys. Okay, so... I'll let uh, Charlie talk a little bit about project rollover when it gets to him. Um, all I can say the good is that uh, we've been continuing to, to print parts and we're about 85% done with that. So um, that's good. And then uh, I think the, ug the, the ugliest thing on that side is that um, we haven't really done as much heat testing as I would like. Um, so once Charlie's in the office this week, we're gonna do some more of that. Um, so on uh, that's on the, the prototyping side of things. Um, on the um, first prototype for the Mark II with Kevin, um, yeah, at the end of last week, we, we posted the, the repo and uh, since then, mostly been working on quotes Kevin has, so we've got some good looking several options there. Um, and meanwhile, I've been making more progress on the industrial design. Uh, so that's that's kind of been mostly where my, my time has been spent, uh, kind of taking, we just had the blocking file that we shared with the community, really didn't have the final plastic design, so I'm going through and, and working on that the detailing of that. Um, hopefully I have something actually to share of concrete um, by the next meeting, say Thursday. Uh, I don't think there's anything too ugly over there. <laughs> um, I feel like everything's going pretty well there. Uh, I think the, the one thing that Josh wants to talk about is um, in terms of the the, the Wi-Fi setup aspect of it, I think there are some aspects of that that um, that might overflow just in that how we're thinking about prototypes. And I mentioned at the beginning of the call, like I've been thinking about the value of of making more of the off-the-shelf style prototypes while we're also 
moving towards the um, the new design. I guess I should use the, the correct terms here. Uh, so we've called the new design, um, what are we calling it? Uh, the board anyway. Oh, yeah, so the, yes, the whole thing is the, Yeah, the whole thing is the dev kit and the, the board itself is SJ201. So yeah, the, the value of making, and so I, I kind of renamed the existing prototypes OTS for off the shelf. So the value of making more OTS prototypes, uh, short term being, um, you know, some people are kind of without devices, uh, especially Ken. And, um, you know, it's still gonna be several weeks, even with the best quotes to get the SJ201. And then some time to bring it up and test it, and it may may not even work the first time. That's to be expected. So yeah, something we want we should discuss. And um, I would personally like once we're done with project well, this phase of project rollover, and presumably if we move to a new phase, we can move on to SJ two hundred one design. Um, that I'd like to put to rest the uh, the form factor version of the OTS uh, design at least uh, and be done with that. So <clears throat> anyway, um, and then if we do, do if we do put that to rest, there are some floating out there, we could you know, collect parts off of them or something. Uh, anyway, something to, to think about. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it for me. OK, thanks, Derek. Um, so uh, Charlie. Derek mentioned that you might have some updates for us. Um, not too much on my end. It's I've been doing the same stuff this past week, and Derek's been dropping off some things for me to uh, some parts for me to cut out. Um, I, I still need to I still need to update the spreadsheet that Derek gave to me. Um, so I'm going to be doing some counting here in a bit. Um, but everything for the most part that I've done looks good. I really need to see um, about Derek. I'm not sure what part it is exactly, but it looks like some of the casing. I, I mentioned that it snapped. I can actually check right now to see if the glue worked or not. Um, but that's the only thing that really went bad on my end. Um, so Derek's been bringing over the um, the housings, and I've been cutting those out um and then when i get in tomorrow i'd imagine i'd help him um test some of the heat um and um we still have not assembled we have not completely assembled any of the units but i'd imagine once we get in that when when i get in the office tomorrow i'd imagine we'd get started on some of those um so overall like i i think lots of the stuff that i'm going to be really getting touched up on is really going to be starting tomorrow yeah, I, w I did go ahead and assemble one. Yeah, I finished oh, the one that we, uh, the, that we awesome. started. Yeah, so we have one. Okay. But parts to do, um, many more. We should easily be able to do five. Mm -hmm. awesome. Charlie, how's your, how's your health? And uh, what happened with your health scare there? Um, everything is good, thank, thank God. Um, I'm glad that I took the extra precautions because, um, I mean, where I'm at right now, it's it's obviously not the worst thing ever. It's not like some cities, but at the same time, like it's just been going around a lot here and just had to take those precautions. So um, I'm glad to see that everybody, my family, my um, friend group is safe. And um, that's just something very, I, that's just something very good for me to see. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Josh, do you have anything that you'd like to uh update us on and uh, not really on the software development side of things uh, I did go ahead and try and get that image working on my existing mark II, and that did not go as planned but uh, uh, other than that I've been on the business side of things uh, I did have a meeting with our friends on the rollover uh, side of things, and I'd forward across some notes about that uh, to the rest of the team. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I have not done any software development work, so no update there. Um, 
Okay, so here's some notes that I have as to things that we could talk about. Um, Ken mentioned uh, data deletion. Um, so I think we should have a brief discussion about the priority of that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other work that he's working on. Um, I'd also like to talk about priorities in general. Uh, Josh mentioned that he tried to update his, uh, his Mark II prototype and it failed. And uh, that set off a series of uh, um, emails, shall we say. So um, we need to, uh, I think we should have a discussion now uh, about um, our priorities uh, around things like uh, the overall priorities. Like we're talking about doing bug fix sprints right now. Uh, although Ken is really more, uh, well, you could classify it as a bug fix or as a performance improvement on the wake word side of things. Uh, it's really kind of kind of both. Um, and then uh, and then there's this issue you know that came up more recently of the boot boot process, Wi-Fi setup, and that sort of thing. Uh, but also the the update process in general for the Mark II, which we've kind of punted down the road. And uh, I wonder if um, now is a good time to start talking about when the, when do we put that back on the roadmap? When do we when do we make the development of a reliable update process for the Mark II a priority? Because obviously, if we're going to be having these things out in the field, we need to be able to update them. Um, and right now, it's all manual. You know, Chris Vare makes us an image. You download it onto an SD card, stick it in the slot. You know, hopefully it works. And um, and sometimes it doesn't. So uh, we need to resolve that process. Um, and. I guess that's really two issues, really. It's the being able to update reliably and the Wi-Fi setup are completely different issues. I guess uh, the boot process is, is related to the, to the update process in that if we apply a bad update, we need to be able to boot anyway and some, have some sort of you know, catastrophic recovery process. Um, that, I think, can be a lower priority just because you know, we're all devs working here, right? So if there's a catastrophic failure, the fallback plan is okay, and then make a SD card flash and update it that way. Uh, but I do think that we should uh, get onto the roadmap a process whereby we can update the Mark II dev kits, you know, over the internet. So, um, anybody have any thoughts about that process and what that's going to entail? Yeah, I mean, I just want to foot stomp that we'd spent a lot of time from. June to December working on, you know, setting up the Mark II over and over and over again. We'd had Kusal come in and record the actual audio prompts so we didn't have to do the speech synthesis. It could sound supernatural, which of course is people's first impression of our product. Um, we'd done a lot of work around the graphics and we'd done a lot of work around stability. And, and then we, we shifted over to Pi 4 and just kind of set all that stuff aside. Um, you know, the at the end of the, you know, for, for us to ship a product that people are able to use doesn't necessarily require us to have the best music player skill or the best, um, you know, news skill. Uh, what we do have to have is the ability for somebody to take that device out of a box and connect it to the network. And then on the wake word side of things, that thing, need, the wake word stuff needs to work fairly well um, so that people can activate it both, you know, when the room is silent and you know uh, through barge in and then finally so that it doesn't inadvertently activate all the time which can be a, both annoying and a privacy risk you know if we can get those things working you know get our software development process sharpened to the point where you know i was talking to michael earlier today you know i was reading I, it was netflix or one of the other bigger companies where a new employee their first day at work they push a change the first day for a new software developer they push a change all the way through to production right so even if it's just adding a comment to one file you know they're able to take that and push it all the way through to millions of users globally on their first day at work so if we can get the initial setup process squared away and if we can get the wake word experience the wake word and kind of the entire the the activation feedback experience working properly, you know, we can push updates to the rest of it um, through an update process that's very fast and flexible. Um, and that puts us in a position where we can really start moving and doing some 
you know, building a great product. But until we cross that line, you know, I, f I feel as though we're in park and I, I almost feel as though we're in park going all the way back to the original video, Derek, you remember I had my mom set up a Mark one or try to, and just showed the video, you know, made everybody just sit there and squirm while for 15 minutes, she tried to get the thing on network before she finally gave up. Um, until we can get that stuff squared away, the, the rest of it's, it's, uh, you know, we can have the best best of every other piece of the stack, but if the wakeward stuff and the initial setup don't work, we might as well go home. Well, I, totally, I, I totally agree with that sentiment. Um, I think we have to look, at, in terms of priorities, we have to look at, um, you know, how, how many, who, who is this going to affect, right? Uh, currently, if we were to create a, you know, we have a continuous um, integration test suite now, right? But what we don't have is a continuous deployment process, right? Or really even a deployment process for the Mark II, right? And that's because there, there is no such thing as a Mark II right now, right? There's a bunch of varieties of different kinds of hardware with off-the-shelf parts and this new experimental thing that we're you know building that will hopefully turn into the dev kit. Um, and there's the Frankencrofts and, you know, whatever's running on your desktop. There's, there's a whole bunch of varieties of software, right? And if we go and build a uh, deployment process that will allow us to update a Mark II, we have to decide, okay, well, which Mark II are we talking about? The Pi 3 based Mark IIs that everyone has, uh, the Pi 4 based Mark IIs that we're moving towards, uh, the Pi 4 based Mark IIs with our own SJ201 board on them. You know, those processes are going to be different for every single one of those devices. Uh, and hopefully minor differences between, you know, the Pi 4 based ones, but still there's going to be driver differences. Um, they're not even using the same uh, chipset for the uh, Vargin stuff. So, um, you know, so there are going to be some differences there. And I don't think that the work in general of setting up a continuous uh, deployment process will be wasted. I think that that is good work that, you know, we need to do regardless. Um, but my question is, you know, how much work is that and what are we giving up and who is it going to affect if we, you know, if we decide to focus on that now versus focus on that in, you know, a month or two months or three months, right? So, for example, um, how critical is it to our partners over at Rollover if, um, you know, if they have to manually flash their devices to get updates? Like, uh, I think that's a, a question that, you know, we can't answer. I think they should answer that question. Um, and you know, verse and the trade-off being that, you know, uh, while we're doing that work, we're not fixing whatever bugs, you know, that we can or whatever other uh, process improvements we can make. So, um, so yeah, but that's 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 my my thought. Um, you know, absolutely. Before we're ready to release anything, this this process needs to be ironed out. Um, but um, you know. How much are each of you relying on the Mark II, uh, you know, prototypes to in your in your day-to-day -day work? Like, how how useful would it be to you to be able to to get updates, you know, you know easily, um, like every day or you know, as as they're pushed out? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the challenge at the moment is that um, because we it, it comes back for me, it comes back to the KBQT. Piece because at the moment the the Mark II prototypes that we're talking about are KB images and all the KB code is on a separate branch and so then the, the challenge has been that that you know is a is a fork of our of our main code base and so then has to be maintained separately um, and the same with each of the skills that are on it which is why Chris then spent had to spend some time like up manually updating all the skills rather than them just doing it all themselves. So, um, you know, now that we've find out, we've shifted the, the Kiwi branch from 19.8 to 2002, um, theoretically updating the devices, like keeping that branch up to date should be fairly straightforward in terms of, you know, just updating that branch and then doing a git pull um, uh, for Minecraft Core, um, but it, you know that that's clearly not the solution that we're talking about here. But this is a, this is a sort of um, development process um, that should work. 
Um, but then, yeah, the whole thing just comes back to me to, to we're maintaining two separate images, two separate forks at the moment, and that slows everything down. Yeah. Okay. So just to recap there, the Kibi versus QT split was, or Qt, I think they call it, um, is, uh, is the GUI, we, we created our own uh, version of that late last year because we simply just couldn't get the Qt version running on the hardware that we had, right? Was that? On the Pi 3, yeah. On the Pi 3, right. And it does work on the Pi 4. Correct? Okay. Um, so, in, so what are the ramifications of picking one versus the other? I guess this is probably, hmm, do we have want to have that discussion now or, um, <laughs> okay. Anyway, no, you know what, let's, 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 let's table that, but we do need I, to, I wonder to resolve if, I wonder if we need to come up with some criteria for how we're going to yeah, make that exactly. decision. As the first step, yeah, yeah. And my my first thought was, well, what's the performance difference, right? I the the, the reason that it didn't work on the Pi three was the Qt version had some performance repercussions that you're just overloading the Pi three. That's my understanding. But um, maybe there's some hardware support in the Pi four that makes that easier, or what? Um, but yeah, we should we should get some criteria for this. Um, okay, so let's take that as an action to deal with. And um, okay, so the Kibi versus Qt is is one problem. Uh, then there's the Wi-Fi setup. Well, and then in terms of the update processes, I, I think there's a few approaches. There's you know there's the Git Git approach, which I don't think is the right solution. There's um, you know dead packages um, and you know using our apt repo. Uh, which is what we use for the Mark One, um, and then there's this new process that we've been flirting with around, you know, with something like Snap Packages, um, the way to go. Uh, so they're, they're the sort of three main routes that I can see. Right. Okay, so we should come up with a uh, criteria for evaluating those as well. I mean, we've had this discussion a couple times in the past, so it's not like this is new, but we should, let's, let's do it formally. Um, right, and then there's the Wi-Fi setup, which we've you know, talked about copiously via email and, and whatnot. So uh, we have some decisions to make there as well. Okay, so those are the things that are keeping us from making uh, the boot and update process, uh, you know, something that we can just start work, work on, right? We need to make some decisions on which path we're gonna take. So, um, who is in a good spot to, uh, to write down the criteria, or at least start that list for us, for these three things? Um, I probably could do some of that work. Okay. Excellent. So, Chris Bear, we'll start off by uh, creating our first list of criteria for the GUI, Wi-Fi, and update uh, criteria. Okay, so, excellent. Um, let's, take a, let's take another easy question here. Uh, do we need more OTS dev kits? Um, do we need any more uh, Pi 4 based dev kits using the respeaker array for barge and support? How useful would that be to you, Ken? Um, I, I was going to say that, you know, I, not having any equipment at all, um, I wouldn't mind waiting until we feel we have a Mark II that is our final form factor, and I could be the first guinea pig for our install process. In other words, assuming we had our install down, we had our all the stuff that has been being complained about regarding Wi-Fi setup and everything working, I was hoping to be like the first 
guinea pig for that process and give feedback and continuously go back and forth through that until it's perfect. Because that to me is really where you need to have perfection. I mean, if you have old mark, you know, ones that aren't upgrading right, or if you have desktop stuff that's not working great, I wouldn't see that as as big a problem as if you're shipping a product and the product's not working and it's not upgrading and it's not installing. So I'd love to focus on that whole process as a user, if you will. Okay. Uh, the one objection I have to that approach is that you're working on the wakeboard stuff, which is going to become very intertwined with the barging support as soon as you've got a device. It is, but we're not going to have a device, from what I understand, that we can get me that would be in that state with all of the install perfect and the Wi-Fi working for at least several weeks. Am I not mistaken? Am I mistaken there? Oh, it could be longer than that. But we can yeah. get you. We can get you a working Pi Four version that. No, but that's what I'm getting at. In other words, uh, you know, I, I'm sure I could like go out and even get a Pi Four and take our schematics and put one together. I, I'm looking at it more like this is kind of our, you know, chance to make sure that everything's perfect and it works as a shrink wrap app off the shelf. Um, well, uh, I, I I don't think you're ever gonna get to experience that, but we'll uh, we can try. Uh, what is that? Let me put a couple of caveats on 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 what we're doing with with Kevin. So, um, you know, the boards are going to take three weeks before he you know, he's got to finish them himself by hand, possibly. And then, you know, we've talked about this over front. There's a, a very strong reality that they may not work or they may need heavy reworking. So, yeah. And then, you know, at that point. Don't, they won't also they won't also be in a, a production enclosure or anything to begin with we'll be looking at the laser cut what we call internally you know the Frankencroft design um, to start with right so that that will impact to a certain degree some of the performance um, you know so we're not going to be looking at doing full optimization or anything it's not going to be you know what you'd consider a, a real product for for a while um, so I think there's some some value. So the, the, the question I guess would be, okay, maybe four weeks realistically to get something in hand if things go well, uh, that is just a board and a Pi 4 in a laser cut enclosure um, versus maybe something Charlie can switch to once we um, get done with the project rollover prototypes that would be based on, on our current stuff. Uh, maybe by in the next week. That's kind of what it, the two comparisons, I guess. I mean, uh, I, I guess my point is I'm a good guinea pig because I can be pretty dense when it comes to installation stuff. I kind of like, you know, <laughs> I'm one of these people that's pedantical. If it says something, I do it, you know? Uh, my concern is I become too comfortable with the product and its idiosyncrasies and can work around them and won't catch all the gotchas during the bring up process and the installation and upgrade process, which is really the pain we're trying to make sure our customers don't feel. And, um, you know, yeah, so, I, I hear so you I'm, I'm flexible, I'm flexible. You can okay. ship me one ahead of time, I don't care. Yeah, I'm just okay, saying so, that. So here's what I want you to look out for, is uh, at some point, uh, you're gonna get to the, you know, to a point in the wake word uh, process that, um, you're, you know, we're, we're going to want to test the barge and support, right? We're not, we're not there yet right now. We're, we're just testing the core precise algorithm, but at some point we're going to need to test the barge in and a wake word working together. And, and it, there's going to be an effect there. I don't know what that yeah. effect is going to be. Um, but that's my question is like, what is the effect, right? The, with the audit, you know, the echo cancellation and, um, you know, and the, uh, and the efficacy of the, uh, you know, removing the speaker output from the microphone input, you know, that whole process, you know, that's going to affect the clarity of the signal being fed into precise, right? And so Absolutely. that may have a huge impact on the training that is necessary to get a good precise model, right? But the work you're doing now with what, you know, I guess we could consider fairly clean data, uh, but who really knows, you know, where that, what the quality of that data is, uh, like, was it? you know, through a headset mic like I'm wearing or through a 
speaker, you know, a microphone on the desktop or what, right? There could be all just all kinds of garbage in these, in these uh, sure. recordings. So, um, in any case, uh, I think it's going to change drastically, and it may affect affect what kind of model, you know, actually performs best in the real world. So, uh, once you've got a process down for identifying a well-trained model, and then that I think we can set that as a target. Like, okay, well, we know we can at least do we can do at least this well. Right, then I think we need to start considering. Okay, okay, now let's do it with Barge in, right? And so I want you to have a device uh, to be able to do that with, right? Uh, and from that perspective, I would say, as soon as you have all the stuff like Barge in and, and all that stuff running, get me a unit. Um, I should have a lot of this stuff. You know, a lot of this stuff is going to be ongoing background stuff. Certainly, I'm parameter tuning and stuff. So. You know, once I get the process locked down, and I don't anticipate that being more than another week or two, uh, then I'll have some bandwidth on that. You know, I don't need to sit around and watch models build and right. watch hyperparameters. So, so yeah, I would say that um, if you feel like you'll have that stuff in the next couple of weeks, then, yeah, in a couple of weeks, it'd be good to get me a unit, even if I've got to hack it together or whatnot. So I can start looking at, is, is the barge in working? You know, is it configured right? Are we getting feedback through the... Uh, you know, speakers. Yeah, that'd be great. So, okay. yeah. I'm, so, I'm flexible. There. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a better answer. Okay. So, uh, Derek, if you can get Ken one in a couple of weeks, that would be useful to him. Okay. Who Somebody else? else the, other, uh, the other people are deficient. One is you, yourself, Michael, <laughs> uh, and Josh uh, does not have a Pi 4 based unit. Um, so is there value in us building, say, three more? Um, uh, the only I can reason mod. I, I, I would want one is to be able to yell at you guys. But you know, I, I know <laughs> what the state of things are right now. So okay. uh, I don't need that. I would actually, I will be very involved in bringing up the, uh, the SJ201 based model, though. So I'll need something for that. But okay. know, we're a ways away from that. Well, I can send Josh. I can just send you the laser cut files um, that we're using, and you can just take that one apart and put a pie floor in and put it in. You know, cut yourself a new enclosure, assuming you can get some acrylic. But I will send Ken. I will. We will work on one uh, to send to you that you don't have to do much. It's just plug it in and go. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. So I think we have a unique opportunity here too that um, if we continue to dev on these um, Pi 4 Frankencroft D things, um, then and work everything out that we can here, I think it would be an interesting exercise to once the, the new prototype is ready to go to see what the pain points are going from one to the other. Um, because I think one thing we've talked about is that, you know, whatever we're doing should be as generic as possible to, um, you know, to any form factor, you know, what are the pain points going to be if we have everything kind of, you know, polished up for this Frankencroft and then we move over to the next device, where's, where is that pain? Right. Yeah, I, I think that there's definitely going to be some impact in terms of the acoustics and how that, you know, but it's TBD, how that's going to affect the wake word uh, and barge in process. I definitely think that there's some tuning in, and it's going to be necessary, but um, I don't I don't know how involved we're going to have to get. But yeah, I agree. I think it would be, it'd be great to have a well-defined process for one very particular piece of hardware, including the enclosure, right? And then, uh, and then be able to see what's the difference between that and you know, just a completely different, the, the same electronics, but a different 3D print, for example. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's definitely value of having us know too that although we want the barge in to be better on the Frankencroft designs, um, you know, we haven't tuned any of the, the, the way that it's currently working, um, but it does work at, at a reasonable volume. So we at least have a benchmark. Um, on the new, to, to compare the new design too, right? Uh, say performance-wise, mm -hmm. uh, we need to match this. Uh, we need to match the Reed Scrooper Micro A uh, at least, I think. I mean, we, 
Yeah, I mean, really I think connecting. you should be able to barge in at max volume. Yeah, we should be able to do much better, but we should be able to at least <laughs> match the performance of, of the, the re speaker. Okay. Great. So it sounds like the answer to the question of how many new model new ones do we need are is uh, one for Ken. Uh, and uh, and I didn't hear Josh uh, say that he could DIY one if you gave him the parts. But I think we can assume that. One thing I'd like to add is that we'd originally had some kind of an abstraction that, that was called the enclosure abstraction, where the idea was that we would, you know, layer that on top of the generic software so that it would customize it for whatever form factor. And so, you know, as we do this, let's think about it in the context of in the future, we may want to support hundreds or thousands of different pieces of hardware. You know the the generic support for all of that, and then for abstraction could be like changes or customizes the core code for example, or a smart speaker, rather than for that we distribute in core just for the Mark II and then leaving it an exercise to the user that for your automobile. Right. No, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing I was talking about a few months ago when I talked about uh, developing a process. You know, the, the first product that we're working on is the Mycroft core, right? This, this whole software stack with Selenium included and all that. Uh, but the second, you know, product we need to develop is the development environment for someone to take our software and build their own hardware with it. So, but that's, I mean, that's a, that's a next year thing, right? Um, but, um, you know, and there's, there's still fundamental architecture questions that we haven't, you know, uh, asked, I think, let alone answered, such as, um, do, uh, do we need to trade a new wake word for every enclosure? Or can we characterize the audio performance of an enclosure uh, and capture that entirely within the front end, you know, uh, the XMOS, uh, you know, acoustic cancellation chip, right? That, um, you know, can can we push all that work up to that chip, or do or do we really have to do that and train a work root model for every enclosure, um, or you know, or even maybe some other pre-processing uh, work, right? Like there's, I've got all kinds of ideas about, um, you know, ways that we can try to cancel out the. Um, uh, the frequency response of the various components of the device, um, which is something that we could potentially do in software and do in an automated fashion. Um, but you know, we haven't even started to talk about that stuff. So um, we we need to get to the point where we can do one and then figure out how we're going to abstract it. So uh, let's see what else was on here. So that was supposed to be an easy one. It wasn't quite as easy as I'd hoped. Go figure, right? Um, oh, I guess uh, I don't really know when the dev kits that Charlie's working on are are expected to be done. Do we have an answer for that? When we can when we can deliver these to um, to rollover? Well, I think since um, we should be back in 100% tomorrow. I think it's reasonable that we can have, Josh had requested at least five, um, although we promised them seven. Um, did, was that a typo or did you mean to ship five first or ship them in two batches, Josh? Uh, they needed five is what they needed, but if we all promised them seven, we might as well ship them seven if it's just as easy. Well, it, I, I, I would love to be at a point where we could ship at least five by the end of the week, if that's what they need immediately. You know, hopefully we can do all of them, but um, minimally five by the end of the week. That sounds reasonable. Okay, great. Um, all right, so next question. Um, 
Okay, so the data deletion uh, issue. Um, now, as a, this is a this is a policy issue, right? We we told our you know we told people that we would delete their data if they asked us to, and we have not yet done that. Um, I know that Ken uh, and uh, I forgot who else. Well, I guess it was probably Chris Bear. Um, we're looking into the account IDs and trying to match those up and see how many uh, accounts we have that um, have data that has been um, retained improperly. Um, do we have an update on that? I think the, the biggest question I would have just from a high level is how many people that opted into the program have opted out? Good question. Bear, we can't hear you. Yeah, we don't have that data right now. We're now starting to capture it, but we don't have it historically. Well, we can recreate it though, right? We can just look at who's opted in now and create the list of people. No, who no, that, but what I'm wondering is, is in other words, I don't know that I trust that. In other words, maybe we don't have opt-in flags for 20 or I don't know, 100 people, but the question is, have any of them even opted out? I mean, are we creating a not, an issue that doesn't exist? Is my concern. Right. I think I think it's fair. Like we we should decide what our policy is. I don't. Has anyone considered the issue of someone creates an account, opts in, then deletes their account? Have they opted out, or did they just delete their account? Can we retain that data or not? Is there any way that they can ever delete that data because they don't have an account to tie it to? Right. Um, actually, I think there's an existing Jira issue for this. I considered it a while back. Um, yeah, I'm I'm coming in at the tail end of the process, so I'm not. You'll have to excuse me for coming I mean, in. But that, I have that's a, that's a config parameter on their account. That's an easy. So number one, no, we can't. We, the unless Chris designs the database as a basically an accounting database where you keep track of the transactions instead of keeping track of the state. Um, then no, we can't determine if somebody flipped the bit because we don't have the historic we don't have the historic state, right? So all we can do is give you a whitelist of all these people are currently opted in, and then we can compare it against the files and see if there are files in there from end users who have not opted in. As simple as that. So we need to do a quick comparison again between one and the other. So that's the first item, and then. You know, the second item, that's easy. We always err on the side of more privacy for users. So if you delete your account, we delete your data. Simple, that's a very simple answer. Yeah, so just to tell you what is going on right now. So if somebody hits delete account in the front end, we just blow everything away. I mean, no no trace of that account on our system. Yeah, so, so that should make it easy because- well, we don't have that to should... that triple down. Okay, so that makes it super so easy can, to, you know, th this this auditing process, all we're doing is looking at a whitelist, right? We have a whitelist of people for whom we are allowed to to keep data. If there is any data in the folder that is not associated with that whitelist, we nuke it. So yeah, in the case that they opted and, out, they wouldn't be on the whitelist. And if in case that they deleted their account, they wouldn't be on the whitelist. So in either case, we would nuke the data. Right, but that's what I did last week was I went through our database ran a script using some accounts that Ken gave me, and I came up with 207 accounts that either have had their accounts deleted or have opted out um, from the list that Ken gave me. So that's, that okay. step has been done. Okay, okay so, so... Sorry, go ahead, Josh. So yeah, the next step is to nuke all the data, and then the third step is to disclose. So um, let me just ask a theoretical question. Have you had an opt-in flag set on the site forever? So the earliest users who are most likely to be the largest contributors to the data set that we have that's clean data, which is over a year and a half old. Are you positive that all of these people had an option to set a flag to opt in when they became a customer or when they created an account? Because what yes. if there's a bunch of people that were already created before you created an opt-in account and they never bothered uh, with it? Where does the assumption come from that if we don't have an opt-in, they're definitely opted out? That's what I'm questioning. It comes from the business uh, decision we, that we're a privacy-based company. And, uh, and as Josh said, we always assume the most privacy for the users. 
Yeah, you have an okay. explicitly opted in, then you're opted out. That's our default answer to that question. Each I'm, I'm just, just a, somebody. I'm just questioning if somebody opted in. They don't care, and then they deleted their account. Now you're going to go consume. They don't want you to keep their data. I mean, I'm okay yes. with it. I'm just questioning it. Yeah. Yes, that is the assumption. We will always we will always err on the side of more privacy for the users rather than less. Although you know, it does raise the makes point. Us, like we could. Which, uh, as they delete their account, we could ask if we could retain their data for you know for training purposes. But yeah, that could be an addition to the delete account workflow for sure. But for the I time guess being, I was kind of looking at it that way. In other words, if we have a list of people that we think are not opted in, why don't we shoot them an email and say, "Are you opted in or not?" The problem with what you just said, Michael, is that if we delete an account, we have no no record of what that account was. So we don't know how to tie old Wigberg data, old any data really, to an account that answered yes to that question. <laughs> yeah, I can I can certainly go through and delete the data, um, you know, and then when well, you say disclose, Josh, that's what I was getting at. I'm not sure what we're disclosing to who, you know, about what. We I need mean, to we so. need to disclose to the broader public, and then also if we can identify. Uh, so in the scenario where the person just hit the flag and i don't know how many of those there are we need to contact that person and say hey we know you hit the, hit the opt-out flag but turns out we didn't nuke your data so we just did that sorry um and then you know number two in the case where they deleted the account and we no longer have that information that means that we have to put it out as an announcement to the broader community hey look we fucked up like we kept a bunch of data we weren't supposed to keep it affected you know, 180 users. We don't know who these users were because, of course, we don't have their information anymore. We're sorry we've nuked the data. We didn't access it in the meantime. Uh, we'll work to do better. Yeah. So, I mean, Chris, do you have a list of accounts of people that have opted out? Um, I don't know. It's it's it's, a white list, not a black it's stateful. So, so there's no way there's no way to do it. It's unless. Chris developed a database so that it keeps track of individual changes in the system, then the only thing we're going to know is their current state. We don't have historic information about the original state. We just know what the state is today. No, I get that. Do we have a list of people today whose accounts are currently opted out? If no, well, yeah. if they're not in the opted in list, then yes. Oh, I think, I I think, I think Ken wants a list of, uh, files that he can go delete. Yeah, in other words, what I'm getting at is somebody opts out. Something somewhere should change, and we should be able to differentiate between users who, have, who are currently in the opted out state and who are not. And I'm just asking if we have a uh, list of such customers. Uh, it can, I think, well, I don't know, let, me, let me take a stab at it. We do not have an opt out flag. We have an oh. opt out. We have, we have an opt in flag, which by default is set to false. If the user decides that they want to opt in, then we set that to true, and that's it. And I think uh, Josh was referring to the fact that, well, actually, this is a, this is a question. Uh, Chris there is, we're not using a transaction-based system, right? We're not recording transactions, we're just recording state? Uh, it depends on what we're doing. I mean, the, all the metrics are more transaction-based, but all of the, like, the reference data, like on an account, is all point in time, yeah. Okay. So except for except for your membership subscriptions, we do keep a history of that for um, for billing purposes. But we do have a list of accounts whose current opt-in flag is set to false. Technically, but we can't. We have accounts who don't have that agreement at all in the system. So the, the only thing we can provide you with, Ken, is a list of the people who are currently opted in. If the data comes from somebody who is not on that list, then they are opted out and it needs to be nuked. All right, all right, I'll do it that way, that's fine. I mean, I can do it from either direction. You can give me a list of people who have opted out or people who have opted in, and the assumption is <laughs> the opposite can be said of all the other accounts and delete all their records and I'll certainly do that and I'll let you know what we yeah. end up. It's not like we're missing anything, right? Because we've, we've had 1.2 million wake word data submissions that we haven't looked at. So if we lose them. Well, we... yeah, we, but, <laughs> and when will we look at those? <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I will um, go through 
And before I delete anything, I will pass around an email to everybody in this team to let them know how this algorithm will affect our data set, and we can take it from there, and I could have it ready to turn on and delete those accounts instantaneously at that point. Excellent. I do think it's a good idea. I think yeah. you could have at least uh, Gez or Chris Fair take a look at your algorithm and just give it a once over. Oh, sure. Before you hit the yeah. run button. Yeah, and yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll write the, the update as a user update, and we'll put up a blog post and stuff about what, what we did wrong and why it happened and how we're going to fix it. Uh, hey, I, I'm at the dentist. I was just going to say, really, the most important takeaway from this conversation for me is what's going to change so we don't have this problem in a year? You're going to fix it. Uh, we, <laughs> we, need a, we, we, need a, we need to add some code that when we get an opt-out flag, it, it kicks off a process. Yeah, so, yeah, um, something like that. And then there needs to be a periodic audit script that runs um, just in case that, that, you know, the system was down or something when the person opted out. But Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and then a process for actually deleting the data and maybe even notifying the user. So all I was getting at is, should it sound like the uh, makings of a JIRA ticket, Michael? Oh, it's already in there, and there's comments. Okay. People have been okay. Hey, the I'm at the dentist, so I got a jet. But if there's anything else, shoot me a note. I'm happy to help. All right. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Beth. Bye. Bye. Ken, you have that list of accounts. It's I gave it to you in that list, and it's also in that ticket. So. Yeah, the list of accounts you gave me, if I'm not mistaken, would be the list of accounts of files that I want to delete. Those are the account IDs that, yeah, any, any file related to those account IDs should, be go, should go away. Okay, cool. Oh, so wait. let me uh, okay. write some code to get a count and figure out what data sets that's affected and uh, put that out, and then we can take it from there. That list is in the JIRA ticket, too, for anyone else who wants to see it. Okay, thanks. Um, can I ask, is this, is this problem arisen, like, uh, since Delaney, is it like, did we have a process in Tartarus, or is it just never existed? I don't think this process ever existed. The problem is there's no real link between the reference data on the database, like which accounts we have and which don't, have, which have um, opted in and which have not, um, to other data stores like our wake words and and such. There's no link to that stuff. There, those like that that wake word database is a totally different database that Selene doesn't even know about. Tartar right. doesn't know about. It um, right. You know, yeah. there's also you know there's also files from our um, speech to text transcriptions that or there's no link to those in, in Selene either. They're just sitting out there somewhere. So um, some. At some point, part of this process of, of being able to do this as it happens is some link between those two things, some some way to say, okay, this guy deleted this account. What do I need to do to link this to, um, you know, other data that may relate to that account? We have never had that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think there was ever a process in place, to the best of my knowledge, from what I've seen in the code I've looked at, to delete data. Um, associated with uh, wave files and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the policy has been in place for years. Yeah. So it's a manual process or something. Like, it just, I'm kind of surprised because like we've like quite actively told people that we delete their data if they opt out. I, I think I mean, that, that process was there on the speech to text side, and it probably was manual, if I recall. I think, you know, if, if somebody said something, I think there was a manual effort to go out and delete some things, but this was never automated, and it's probably one of those things that just never made it to the top of the, of the queue. I'm sure it's been an outstanding item to do, but never. <laughs> and no one's ever actually gotten it. Well, I just think, I think people figured, hey, you know, deleting data is easy. Give me an account ID, and if it's in the uh, file name, which... Yeah, which also may be an issue, because some of those file names are hosed. I don't know how that happened, and I haven't gotten to the bottom of that. Uh, but yeah, I just don't think anybody ever bothered to think about it. They just figured it was a trivial issue. We could drive off that bridge when we come to it, and now we're coming to it. Yeah, so I think I think the issue that this highlights for me is that if if we 
have, if we ever collect data from a user for any reason, we need to consider our policies, like our opt-in policy and that kind of thing. You know, we may end up with more than one policy. We may have, you know, we may end up with a separate policy of wake words or versus speech to text and that sort of thing. Um, but anytime we start to collect a new data, we need to, you know, consider the whole business case there, right? And not just collect data, but also be able to, you know, delete that data and also implement the process that was described wherein when we release a data set, you know, people downstream who are using our data set, it gets deleted from their data set as well, right? That's why we have, we have a, an agreement. Like it's our, our data sets are available to other people to copy and use, but they're not free. You, you have to sign uh, an agreement to get a copy of our database. And in that agreement, it says that you will refresh your database from, you know, from our servers every 30 days. And as a consequence, if we delete data from our servers, it will eventually get deleted from other people's servers, right? And that's, well, that's the process that well, we this, The problem is this, like it, like so many things we talk about, this, this promises to just explode into this huge issue. But really, at the end of the day, what other data do we collect? Does this uh, policy apply to metrics? and uh, things of this nature as well. So if I don't want to be associated, I want to delete my account, are you to drop me from historical metrics values and numbers? Uh, that's uh, a how, good can we, how can we impose the 30-day refresh policy on non-cooperative clients who are, or users who may choose to keep that data? And you know, what's the responsibility level there? I mean, I, I just don't know. I, I don't know what our corporate governance is, but I mean, certainly if these are gonna be issues like this, we need to probably enunciate them and document them and, and back them with some sort of processes to make sure they're implemented. Well, there's lots of issues like this. And this came up when, when I started doing the account level metrics is that, you know, because of our policy, privacy policy, we need to really be, um, explicit about what is included and what is not because the way it is it's the way we're operating right now we really have no good way of knowing what our daily active user count is because right now we only know if you're at, if you have activity if you opted in so we know what how many of our opted in people have daily activity but um, since that's only 15 percent of our total user base it's really a very poor number for us to be able to tell you know who's using the system <laughs> So, um, you know, where, so one of the questions I asked when we were doing this account metric stuff was, you know, and I think we've talked about this a little bit is maybe there's different levels of opt-in versus right now there's one opt-in, opt-in or opt-out, that's it. Um, that basically covers, like we'll talk about this a bit before, is having different agreements um, for different things that, you know, and I think even the privacy policy says there's certain device uh, information that we collect regardless of whether or not you're opted in. So I think it's just, we need to go through all this stuff and say, you know, what data that we have or collect or whatever is, you know, is part of this privacy policy? What isn't? And, you know, what do we really mean by the privacy policy? I don't think anyone's really ever gone through the exercise. I agree hundred percent, Chris. That's kind of where I was coming from was, uh, you know, I don't want to make it a big deal where none exist, or as we say, a mountain out of a molehill. But the reality is, I think we need to, in as much as we're looking at our security audit, we need to look at our privacy policy audit. We need to figure out what our corporate requirements are and make sure we have processes in place that we're living up to our words. I mean, I don't have any Look, what we're doing is we're trying to do a better job than Google and Amazon at being transparent. And that's obvious, right? I mean, good luck you know, opting out of Gmail and then telling them you don't want them to use your information any longer. I mean, it's not going to happen. So we're, we're definitely going above and beyond the call of duty here. Uh, we just need to make sure we know what policies we're committed to corporate-wide and that we have processes in place to carry them out. That's all I was getting at. And I think it's probably the, 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 the stuff of a meeting. Probably yeah. at some point in time, we should have an online meeting, go through it, uh, we'll come away, you know, walk away with some to-do items and uh, and follow through. But, you know, I think we probably need to spend some time on it. I, I agree. And if you'd like to uh, look at this some more, you know, if you're, if you're curious about it, I'm fairly certain there's a number of tickets related to this in the system. 
um, because this is yeah, my, my uh, question. Because I, I don't know where else it applies. I mean, we, this is what we hit in wake words, but there's probably, like Chris pointed out, two or three other areas that are tangential. Yeah, agreed. So, okay. Um, yeah, and I'll report back to, we have limited staff, and I mean, some of this stuff was probably on our old ticketing system too, but you know, it's, at some point, somebody it got some of the things got prioritized over it, and it didn't get done. So, and it's going to be the truth for a lot of the things that we know need to be done. Um, you know, that security list, for example. You know, that's, that's that's a lot of work. You know, where where does that fall in with the other stuff? And there's two and a half developers on the Microsoft staff. So, um, yeah, it's not going to. You know, we have the best intentions, and we want to fulfill those intentions, but. We can only do so much so fast. Yeah, but Chris, we may only be two or three developers, but we are supermen. <laughs> uh, agreed. So um, the one last issue on here that we haven't talked about uh, for follow-up is the WordPress droplet issue. Um, what is, uh, is that something that we all need to talk about or is that something that you need to talk about with anybody else in particular or is it just like something that's going to take Well, Gens and I did it together last time. Okay. And I was just hoping he remembered where this he put together. Was it you? I think it was Gez that put together like an, an image that we, or maybe Gez and Derek did it, an image that we put up that said that site's not available. And last time we did this, we had that image up. And then we read, read it all the WordPress stuff and then we took the image away. I just can't remember for the life of me where that image resides and where we serve it from so that I can put it up while I resize this droplet. Yeah. Um, maybe I should just um, do a sync of our test site and then we can point to that temporarily uh, and then switch back. <laughs> would that work? That would be a short term solution, yes. Yeah, I could just change the. Actually, no, that's really dangerous because database stuff, <laughs> uh, just when you have purchases and things. Um, would it, maybe we just spin off a droplet, throw a Nginx server on there, and and host it. That's the thing, I thought we had done that already, right? And I'm just, I can't oh, right. find it. You know, we, we've done this before, you know, it, it should be, and then we have a droplet called maintenance page something. All right, well, you guys, how about you guys, you guys can carry on. I, I will, uh, I yeah, think we're done yeah. here unless there's anything else people need to talk about uh, with all of us here. Um, any other issues people want to bring up that we haven't talked about yet? No. Um, so one thing I want to know, just to be clear, for my efforts this week, we're still just taking away on the bug fix sprint, right? Aside from this criteria thing, I just volunteered for. Right. Yeah, okay. and I think at our next big things we may um, may decide that that's a priority. But yeah, for the time being, it's, we're bug fixing away. Okay, should I schedule a meeting to go over this criteria? I mean, we're gonna have to eventually actually talk about this stuff. <laughs> Agreed. And make a decision. Is it worth doing like a security audit and uh, just popping around to you know, have a stab at it, post the ticket mm. and assign it to someone? Yeah, that's a good idea. So Chris will make the first draft and then pass it off to the next dev. Just, just keep okay. adding it until it gets back around to you. All right. Excellent. Okay, guys, have a good week. All right. All right. Cool. See, you See you guys. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, yeah. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. <laughs>